Developing tonight, new reaction keeps pouring in after our interview with the Duggar family. It's now fueling a new debate over the media's treatment of outspoken American Christians. Last night, Blaze TV host Dana Lash accused the Duggars' critics of seizing on this scandal in order to silence them and others. If you want to talk about fear-mongering and hate-mongering, which isn't a substitute for just thinking differently and being of the faith and thinking differently on same-sex marriage, you have to look at the head of Mozilla who was driven from his job. Look at all of the individuals, the Benham brothers, the Robertsons. Any Christian, Megan, in pop culture is eviscerated by the left if they hold a position of faith on a social issue. And this is just a vehicle through which to further attack Christians. They're exploiting it. Joining me now, Mary Catherine Hamm and Guy Benson. Both are Fox News contributors, and they are co-authors. They have teamed up to write this book, End of Discussion, How the Left's Outrage Industry Shuts Down Debate, Manipulates Voters, and Makes America Less Free and Fun, meaning less fun. Great to see you both. Good, Good to see you. you. So this is a new book, and you guys both work together and worked on it together, and it, it cuts to the heart of some of these issues we're talking about here. Dana's position was not to defend the actions of Josh Duggar. It was to say the outrage is excessive and over the top against this family because they happen to be the one thing you cannot be, which is outspoken Christians who oppose gay marriage. Let me start with you on that, Guy, since you were very open about being a gay Republican yeah. here in the <laughs> Kelly file. And you, you've defended Christians, not in the Duggar's position, but from attacks like these before. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the examples that we heard there from Dana was the CEO of Mozilla, who was driven, uh, driven out of the company that he helped to found back in the day because it turned out he had donated to Proposition 8 in California in 2008, which passed in a very blue state, holding a position that at the time was held by President Obama as well. This was determined a thought crime so egregious that he could no longer run the company, not because of any discrimination, not because of any actions he had taken, but because of his thoughts. And that was one of the reasons that we decided to write in a discussion, because that is not the kind of country that we want to live in. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of dislike for this family as there is for a lot of Christian outspoken people you know prior to their scandal because the gay and lesbian community genuinely feels that what they're being outspoken about is hatred and bigotry right it, yeah it's, it's sort of blown into more than disagreement on an issue and turned into only hatred or bigotry when those two are not necessarily interchangeable and that's something we argue for in end of discussion is like hey we're human beings here we can have this exchange and we can disagree about certain issues guy and i uh happen to be pro same-sex marriage mm -hmm. and we disagree with many friends and colleagues uh on this issue but we have that discussion all the time and it's not about hate and bigotry so i think that's what what people are responding to and th i think there's another double standard here watching this duggar story as just as a human being who watched these young women sort of grow up on tv yep. uh you have a heart for them and they were so well spoken with you another interesting double standard is that it seems like people are awfully quick to parse the victim's words in this mm -hmm. case and quick to in an age when we're so fast to be uh obsequious to victims in sexual cases mm -hmm. even to the point of getting rid of uh, due process. Due process. That's right. Oh yeah, in this a case, lot of people a lot wanted of... to see me bring the Duggars down. I mean, it's like th these two Let them talk. women. Like, I, I, my job, job was to get the story. My right. job was to get the story. L let's talk about another story, which is, did you, you guys went to high school, obviously. You seem like well-educated people. Were you valedictorian? No, I was not. You should have gone to school in Dublin, Ohio. Yes. <laughs> There were 222 uh, valedictorians Woo! because they all got some, not even 4.0, but like 4.15. I don't know. It's like above 4.0. Oh, it goes now. higher than that. So what is this about, Mary Catherine? <laughs> the little cupcakes. It's not enough to be in the top 10 percent. Now you have to be number one, even if oh, you're not really necessarily yes. number the one. The millennial snowflakes. Uh, I can say this because I am a millennial and I'm not all, always down on them, but I'm like the grandma of the millennials. <laughs> I'm the oldest millennial you can get, so I can say to these whippersnappers back in my day, look, one person should be the valedictorian. If you have a tie, maybe two people, but goodness gracious why can't we have a leader something. anymore it's already happening even in my kids they're in preschool already they all get trophies for everything guy yeah and i don't give it to them 20 percent of the graduating class was valedictorian <laughs> that is lunacy it, right it so cannot be i want to know how long this graduation ceremony is going to be if all the val valedictorians get to speak i know right? or do they pick one in which case one special snowflake is 
more, than more special. Than this is what they have, have to, to learn to say. You're not the best. Right. You're, you're, you're are second best. You're going to have to try harder. Sorry, that other person took a harder AP class than you took right. and did better than you did. And by the way, not everybody deserves an A plus on every exam. That's, a, that's why we, you know, we grade on a curve. Anyway, uh, I'm just bitter because I was also <laughs> valedictorian except for the 200 people who graduated right, right, right in front of me. Valedictorian is the new participation. Yeah, sure. but I did go to Syracuse University. It was a very good school. Except for the fact I didn't get into the Newhouse Communications <laughs> School. But now they claim I went there, but wow. I didn't. Ooh. What? Not Ooh. bitter? No, that's I'm a, not. That's a fact check right That there. is not the end of discussion. One more thing I want to talk to you about. Jerry Seinfeld sees the wor world as you do. And like you guys in the book, is sick of the PC nonsense. Listen here. I don't play colleges, but I hear a lot of people tell me, don't go near colleges. They're so PC. They just want to use these words. That's racist. That's sexist. That's prejudice. They don't even know what talking about. He's talking about your people, guy. You young people in hey, college. Hey, hey, you were there more recently than the rest of us. That is true, but that's why we wrote this book and a discussion, because we agree with him and not with some of the people who want to use every element of speech and impugn motives. Look. Part of the subtitle is how this culture makes America less free, and we talked about that with people getting fired from their jobs, for example, but it also makes America less fun. What college student does not want Jerry Seinfeld to show up and play or at Or Chris Rock, Rock, who has said the exactly. same thing. George Carlin said the same thing about exactly. colleges before yeah. he died. It's like you can't say anything, otherwise the PC police will come and say, Mary Catherine, I'll let you say it, it is the... End of discussion. <laughs> That's what we say. It's burst on college campuses. It is weaponized in D.C. And then it goes all over the country and gets to police every little thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. Not discussion. healthy. Uh, that is the end of discussion for now. It's a <laughs> pleasure to see you both. Good Thank luck you. with the book. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right. You are listening to American Conservative University podcast number 1310. Coming up, Joe and Mika of the morning. Joe showed on MSNBC interview the authors of the book. End of discussion. Thinking about how America's culture has come to PC with us now to talk about that, Mary Catherine Ham and Guy Benson. They're the co authors of the new book, End of Discussion uh -huh. How the That's Left's Outrage Industry Shuts Down Debate, Manipulates Voters, and Makes America Less Free and Fun. We all we see this all the time. Hey, hey, Barnacle. Heilman. Heilman. Hi. We're doing a show over here, okay? <laughs> hey, good Lord. Jerry and Elaine, keep it down. Barnacle. Shutting down speech, right? As exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, we, we three see this all the time. You know, and there are certain things that you have to be very careful about talking about. And, and I, I, my pet peeve is this. People want... Let's have a true discussion on race. <laughs> what I have found and what Nika found in a very stinging way several months ago is people don't want a real discussion yeah, on race. Yeah. They want to find the 15 seconds where your mind wandered and you said something stupid. And then for the next five days, you and your children see you being called a racist. And it shuts it down completely. Right. Often the first person to say they want a national conversation is the last person to actually want to engage in a conversation. We would like that to be different, which is why we wrote into discussion. We noticed as people who are coming up in political commentary especially, that more and more subjects were off limits and scary. And it's not just for public figures, which is what bothered us and made us write the book. Even private citizens these days, they're sort of plausibly public if they put something on Facebook and they can become a national news story. And they should not have to live by the same that we do. Yeah, but you know, there, guy, there was a book called The Closing of the American Mind. Yes. Uh, Alan. Alan Bloom, oh, 2025 yeah. years ago. And it was, I mean, for me, it was a very important book, sort yeah. of, in my development. But he was warning about the PC police back then. I thought we'd gotten past it, but it's just gotten worse yes. in any respect. Political correctness has been with us, unfortunately, for many decades. But I think what we're seeing now, especially in an age of social media, is that a lot of this craziness is being born on campus but then it's being weaponized in the media weaponized in washington dc and it's proliferating across the country and it's sort of seeping <clears throat> into all elements of american life give us a specific example well i think an example that just in the news this week beyond the jerry seinfeld stuff which is more on the fun side of our book about right. how they're sort of robbing us of laughter as well uh, there are these gay hotel owners in New York City who had dinner with Ted Cruz. Right. One of them gasp donated to Ted Cruz. Right. There have been boycotts and all these people very angry at them. One of those gentlemen was on Fire Island on vacation over the weekend and a patron confronted him for having dinner with Ted Cruz. Dinner. Right. Breaking and, bread. And they were, there were the shouting and the whole restaurant starts shouting and he was escorted out 
of this bar on vacation well, being jeered at and yelled at. I mean, that is the literal ending of discussion. That is not good. Well, also, I've got to say, well, while we're on that front, I'm more of a libertarian. So you've just never heard me scream and yell about marriage equality or gay, gay marriage being a bad thing. But what bothers me is the discussion is over. And if you side with, let's say, people who have a view of marriage that it should be between a man and a woman, mm -hmm. a 4,000 year uh, institution. Mainstream position. Mainstream position. The, the predominant position in 2004, 2005, 2006. But if you even have a discussion saying, you know, I kind of can, can think it, it should be between a man and a woman, then you're a bigot. Right. And I mean, it is that is another discussion that has been shut down. And again, I'm more libertarian on this. So stuff, are we, yeah. right? But still, it disturbs me. And we had this talk a couple weeks ago, right, Willie, about this religious freedom law, where these people were immediately bigots because they they found it morally wrong. And sort of the reason that we took up writing into discussion was the Brendan Eich incident at Mozilla, when the guy who founded this tech company was ousted because he had given to Proposition 8, which won in true blue California, by the way. It was a traditional marriage yeah. proposition. At the time, Barack Obama was not pro-sex marriage. Um, so it was definitely a mainstream position. And it wasn't his conduct or the way he treated his employees. Uh, it was... The that political he, thought, thought just contributed to a campaign that the majority of Californians, the same year Barack Obama got elected, uh, agreed with. Guy, I want to ask you, because you mentioned college campuses, and I do think the climate there is a lot different today yeah. than it was even 10 years ago or 20 years ago when I was in college. And I've noticed, not as a political analysis, but just as something that strikes me as odd, is that there's a lot of canceling of graduation speakers because mm -hmm. they don't hold the right points of view. Or if they do allow conservative to speak on a campus, they have to provide safe spaces for students to go because they might hear something that right. contradicts their beliefs. Microaggressions, where did, trigger warnings. When did this Rocks. start? Where did it come from? Well, it is an accelerating trend, which is one of the details that we have in end of discussion, saying it's, this is not, it doesn't just feel worse, it actually is worse. Condoleezza Rice, two years ago was, at Rutgers. That, that was stunning. We're, 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 we're absolutely blown away. Christine yeah. Lagarde. Yeah, Christine <laughs> Lagarde at an all-women school, disinvited. Uh, Ion Hersey Ali, disinvited. Invited. I mean, there's sort of one after another, Ben Carson a few years ago at Johns Hopkins. And this, I, when did we get to a point where college students, college students right. must be protected from ideas and thoughts and speakers who might offend them in some way? Well, and the reason that we put in the title of the book, uh, the left outrage industry, as opposed to liberals, there are true liberals out there who still believe in free expression. And right. I think, you know, even, you know, the new left of the 60s, it was about free speech right. in many ways. And now it is the opposite of that. And that is frightening. And so we want to bring those people in. The end of discussion is written in such a way that they will not be angry reading this book, I don't think. Yeah, and we always talk, though, isn't it interesting, Mika? We always talk all the time about certain things that are offensive. Yeah. If somebody on the right says it, but if somebody on the left says it, it we get a collective oh, that's, yawn. That's a constant problem. Does the right have any role in this? <laughs> yes. Good yes. question. We're glad you asked it. We thought you might. Uh, <laughs> so we want to be intellectually honest in end of discussion and recognize this is not purely a phenomenon of the left, of course. And we go through and routinely call out our own side and even ourselves personally in our contribution to this problem. We do believe, however, that this is primarily uh, driven by the left and we cite quite a number of left of center thinkers and opinion shapers who agree with us and I think the reason is the rights outrage merchants and we certainly have them are more easily written off and sidelined by cultural tastemakers as sort of cranks and angry people they are right. less impactful than the lefty versions because the left tends to dominate some very important cultural institutions, be it the entertainment industry, much of the media, and certainly the academy. Don't you like how, how guys understated? I wish I could be that understated. <laughs> understated, yes. yes in, a, we in, in a really good way. Yeah, they don't kind of control. They control the, <laughs> the, the triggers of America's we also, culture. We also point out that there are plenty on the right who might wish that we were better at this game. And yeah. we advise, hey, maybe that's not the way to go, because being offended by every little thing and throwing flags all day long is yeah. not a fun way to live life. By the way, no. did you see Willie Chris Pratt, who is like... Free apology. 
his pre-apology? Oh, that was great. I heard about it. Oh, no, <laughs> it was awesome. He did a pre-apology. This guy, I, I took Jack to go see Guardians of the Galaxy in just the beginning <laughs> of him singing uh, as he went through the cave after Aliens was uh, worth it. But it, he did a pre-apology on Facebook for anything you might say that others found offensive during his <laughs> press tour in Jurassic World. It reads this. To those I will have offended, please understand how truly sorry I already am. I'm fully aware that the subject matter of my imminent forthcoming mistake, a blunder, possibly to be dubbed Jurassic Gate, is most likely in no way a laughing matter. To those I will likely have had offended, rest assured I will do everything in my power to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You should do one and of those. I need one for every day. Yes. yes. And probably my crush on Chris Pratt increases. Yes. Yes, yes. there you go. <laughs> he, he needs end of discussion. Yes, I mean, he does. does. All right, Let's end of it. discussion. The book <laughs> is end of discussion. You could read an excerpt on our site, mojo.msnbc.com. Mary Catherine Hamm and Guy Benson, thank you so much. You are listening to American Conservative University Podcast number 1310. Next up, Kevin Levin interviews authors of the book End of Discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, are you tired of being told what you can and cannot say? Are you tired of being told that you're a denier? Are you tired of being told the debate is over by the left Mary Catherine Hamm, a dear friend of mine, and her co-author Guy Benson, they're tired of it too, and they have a wonderful exposition of this in their new book, End of Discussion, How the Left's Outrage Industry Shuts Down Debate, Manipulates Voters, and Makes America Less Free and Less Fun. Mary Catherine Hamm, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you and your listeners. Well, it is a pleasure for all of us. So first of all, I have to ask you this. How do two people write one book? How do you get along with each other? <laughs> well, we knew before we started that we would get along, so it wasn't as scary writing in a discussion as, as some have thought from the outside. Uh, and I'm, the, I'm a little bit more creative and scatterbrained, and my co-author, Guy Benson, is a you know uh, keep-things-on-a-schedule kind of guy, so he was able to uh, help me out in that sense when we wrote this book. <laughs> And by the way, I want to remind people, you're, you're a wonderful writer and you're prominent at Hot Air. You're also a, a regular uh, a guest on the, on the Fox News channel where you do a tremendous job, particularly with uh, Juan Williams. But, but I want to get back to this book. This book couldn't be more timely. And uh, w when you wrote this book, you probably were fuming by the end when you were done all the examples and instances in which people are told basically by the left to shut up. Right. When we were... Writing end of discussion, it can get very dispiriting to hear all these examples. I mean, we go from large to big, and I think this week you've seen it writ large with, uh, in the aftermath of a tragic shooting, how the left does get very opportunistic about saying, hmm, maybe we can blame this on our political enemies and adversaries and therefore get them to be quiet and not voice their opinions anymore. Uh, they paint with a very broad brush, and it's, it's intentional, and it's uh, cynical. And that's something we try to point out in, in this discussion and how it's organized and well-funded and how, you know, it manipulates every bit of our public discourse and how hopefully making people at least aware of it in this really toxic game can help us sort of reclaim some of it. And you do point out, as you just did now, this is a strategy of the left. It's funded by the left. It's the agenda of the left. And it really, it, it, it seeps into everything. It seeps into college campuses or public discussion, such as it is. And how do we respond to this? How do we, how do we deal with this? Well, that's one of the things we wrestle with in, in the discussion. And the, and the big question is, okay, do we match them outrage for outrage? And sometimes I think that's warranted. There are plenty of reasons, especially in the Obama era, to be truly outraged about what's going on. The VA numbers you see coming out this week, increasing post uh, scandal there, their, their wait times is a perfect example of us betraying those people who help us so much. Um, so there are good reasons to be outraged. I think going after them outrage for outrage sends us into a spiral where we become as sort of nitpicky and, 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 uh, and blowhardy as they are. <laughs> I, think, I think we need to watch out for that because when it creeps into every part of your life, that's the less fun part that we point out in end of discussion. And I've been really pleased in the past couple weeks to see a couple comedians who are certainly no conservatives push back on the PC culture. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld has done it, Jay Leno in the past. Those guys know that in order to sort of have the freewheeling and fun discussion that we have in America, 
you can't have these guys sort of throwing flags and blowing whistles every three seconds and being offended by everything. And I don't want to be one of those guys. <laughs> and who are these guys, essentially, who are throwing these flags and telling us what we can and cannot say? Well, certainly it begins on college campuses, as you point out, and we outline that in End of Discussion. It's sort of born there. It's weaponized among activists uh, in Washington, D.C., for, for the most part, and then it's proliferated all over the country. But one of the things we point out in End of Discussion is even though it's organized and even though it's loud because the left, uh, left, lefty folks in the media like to amplify it, it's not always as many people offended by whatever the outrage of the day is as it seems like. And one of the things we point out is, and this is a way to battle it, is caving too easily doesn't help. Like, caving to these guys doesn't earn you any points. When the hotel uh, owners who ate with Ted Cruz apologized for it, did they earn any points from the left? No. They continued to crush them. I think you have to stand up for yourself. You have to be true to who you are. And I think we've seen, uh, you know, various conservatives be able to do that over the years, and one of the people we cite in the discussion often is one Miss Joan Rivers, the late Joan Rivers, who when they would come to her and say, apologize for your joke, she would say, no. And guess what? The story was over. <laughs> well, you know, I, I look at this Confederate flag issue, whatever anybody's opinion right. is on the Confederate flag, and I see this, it's, it's, like, it's stunning to me. It's stunning to me how all of a sudden, the entire culture moves in this direction, shutting down any discussion. No, no, you must be a racist. You must be a Confederate. If you go, wait a minute, I, I, I want to leave it to the states or the people. Is it? No, no, we're not going to have right. that discussion. Is this a prime example? It is. A, it's a perfect example. And like I think, you know, Nikki Haley and in her job as sort of head healer of her state at the moment, the decisions they make are up to them. And I think it might be the right decision to take it off of a government. Uh, area, but here's the thing where it, they get they get a taste for blood, right? They're like, well, we can't go after guns because that's a non-starter and it failed last time. What we're going to do is go after the flag, which, by the way, whether, whatever you think about it, was not because of these killings, right? So you're not solving the problem by getting rid of it. They go after the corporations. They go after the Walmarts, and they say, you got to remove all this stuff. And I just think whatever you think of the flag, it doesn't need to be banned from every retail outlet. I mean, that's just silliness. You've got people on eBay who sell Civil War relics back and forth, and now that's not allowed in our culture at all. I just It's such an overreach, and it's a perfect example of how these activists instantly turn our national conversation into, no, you will not show this symbol, no, you will not have this discussion, uh, no matter what it is. Well, it also reminds me of the uh, gay marriage issue where, um, okay, fine, people have an agenda, they have a point of view. Now, if you don't accept it, if you don't actually serve that wedding, even though right. you may say it violates your, your religious or your moral beliefs, you have to be beaten into complicity, too. Right, I, and that's, that's been very disturbing, is watching, and got my co-author and I, Guy Vincent, are actually pro same sex marriage, and we disagree with many our, of our colleagues in a kind and loving way, and we have the discussion all the time. Why? Because we don't automatically assume that you're a bad person because you disagree with us on that issue. And we write about religious liberty in, in the discussion and about how, look, they're saying unless you literally celebrate this marriage, despite your religious beliefs, that you must be pounded into dust, that your small business must be taken away from you. And that's that's, we've had PC culture for a long time, but that's weaponized. That's people coming after you in an economic way and hurting your family. And the, the thing is, it used to be all like live and let live, gay marriage, every, you know, I don't affect your life. Well, now they want to affect your life. That's, that's literally the pitch. And it's scary. I'm, I'm speaking to Mary Catherine Hamm, co-author of End of Discussion, which is an outstanding book. The timing is perfect. How the left's outrage industry shuts down debate, manipulates voters, and makes America less free and fun. Where are the civil libertarians of old? You know, they used, who used to who used to demand that we we adhere to the First Amendment, whether it's Skokie, Illinois, whether it's American flag burning the American flag, and so forth. I, I don't hear them anymore. No, I don't hear them either, and I think that's uh, that's a little bit of the. The old, the old left, which I guess called themselves the new left at the time, was very pro-free speech. They were um, a community that was interested in pushing boundaries. But now the left is very interested in setting up in new boundaries for your speech. 
uh, a new thing is offensive every day. If you don't keep up with the rules and you say the wrong thing, you'll be taken down. If there's something in, offense, newly offensive on your Twitter account, um, you'll be punished for it. And so I think people have trouble keeping up, and that's the point. That's, <laughs> that's how they manipulate you and get you to keep your mouth shut. And the thing that really bothered me before we wrote into discussion and that really spurred me to do this was when I saw it trickling down from public commentators to private citizens. Because to some extent, when I go on a show or a radio show or a TV show, I take on a little bit of that language policing, and I'm careful with what I'm saying um, as a consequence of what I do for a living. I know people are looking for me to mess up. On the For private citizens, if you're just posting something on your private Facebook page, you should be able to have some leeway, for goodness sake. And these days, people are feeling like they don't. And that's what we wanted to explore in the discussion. Isn't this, in the end, a totalitarian mindset, though? This this effort to shut everybody up and you have to agree with me? Yes, and it's really creepy because you get to the point, and and it's certainly not only writers and folks who feel this. I think many of the comedians and entertainers um, who feel like they're limited by this feel like they have little, uh, you know, watchers with their camera phones ready at all times, ready to be offended at the drop of the hat and report them uh, to the national media for stepping over a line. And it's really like having your fellow citizens report on you, just like in a totalitarian state. I mean, it, it gets really creepy. Um, and it, it, it's creepy the extent to which they think this is a virtue. <laughs> that this is, oh, well, we're just ridding our society of the right, of the wrong beliefs. Um, they just happen to be all right of center for the most part. And it's, it's really, it's not a good impulse. And that's what we wanted to talk about in the book. Well, I want you to know you, you are a, a terrific writer. Uh, you're a fresh personality. I feel the same way about Guy Benson. Everybody doesn't have to agree on everything. Right. But you're out there and you're trying to make a difference and influence people. It's a tremendous book and we're going to put it on our social sites, ladies and gentlemen. You really ought to get a copy of it. It's, it, the, the timing couldn't be better. I'm talking to Mary Catherine Ham. She's the co-author with Guy Benson. Here's the book. End of discussion. How the left's outrage industry shuts down debate, manipulates voters, and makes America less free and fun. I think you're really going to want to read this book. And I want to thank you for coming on the program. Well, thank you so much, Mark. And between you and me and all your listeners, we're not going to let them shut us up. No. Great. Keep kicking butt. All right. God bless. You take care. And you can get it at Amazon.com and Barnes and & Noble and Books a Million. You can get it at any reputable bookstore or book outlet. Uh, but I would encourage you to get it. Mary Catherine Ham, Guy Benson, these are great, young, new conservative voices. You don't have to agree with everything they say, and that's the point. The left shuts everybody down. The book, End of Discussion, How the Left's Outrage Industry Shuts Down Debate, Manipulates Voters, and Makes America Less Free and Fun. I'll be right back. You are listening to American Conservative University Podcast number 1310. Next, the ladies of the Out of Overtime show interview the author of the book, End of Discussion. (laughs) Outnumbered Overtime! Oh, Chief, baby! So, the last uh, segment on the TV version of us, um, <laughs> Emily Trek says, I'm having a laugh at the word rotating. Uh, she's seeing something different in her head. Uh, we were talking about the fact that one of the presidential <laughs> oh, candidates... Oh, like a, a first lady on a rotisserie. Yeah, probably. Uh, oh. uh, Lindsey Graham, Exhausting. Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, when asked the question, you know, you're not married, what's your plan for first lady? And he said, I do have a sister. Uh, and so apparently the family has talked about that so somewhat from that's reports how it that is I've in read. South Carolina. And then he said that it would be kind of a rotation situation. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I just got that. Uh, Scribble 646 <laughs> says Lindsey Graham on the prowl. Uh, and then let's change the subject. Okay. Uh, Tori and James says Guy is cool. Guy is so cool. And Guy, I, I love how you are defending liberty, how you are defending free speech. You and Mary Catherine Hamm. Uh, I think this book is fantastic and so necessary. And, and you had copies. this idea a long, long time ago, yes. way, way long time ago, before anybody, and I'm just so 
excited to read this because I just got my copy now. But I'm a huge, obviously, fan of yours because you're Thank one you. of our great one lucky guys. But I just love M.K. Hammer so much yeah. that my heart feels like it's going to explode sometimes yes. when I see her on the O'Reilly Factor. Aww. Yes, my uh, my co-author, Mary Catherine Hammond. The book is called End of Discussion. It came out yesterday. It's available at endofdiscussion.com. All of the ladies on the couch have their copies You're so now. sweet. It's wonderful. Oh, I love the picture of the two of you. Yeah, hold it up for the back. It's actually a wonderful marketing I'll hold up the back and you women. hold up the front. Ba, 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 da, 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 da. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if you see the back, you can see there are two pictures on it. Anyway, um, you know what? We had a guest on this week, and you'll have to remind me which oh, one goody. lucky guy it was who said, I think it was Andy Levy, actually, Red Eyes Andy Levy, who said, you know, we've become so politically correct in this country mm-hmm. that there are certain buzzwords that just end the discussion. Like, oh, I'm offended. Right. It's you know, a, a anything with an ist on it's the racist, end. It's racist. It's right. sexist. It's homophobic. Right. And what we argue in end of discussion is that the left, in not mostly the left, not exclusively, but mostly the left, is increasingly seeking to win political and cultural debates by preventing the debate from even happening. They don't have the confidence in their own ideas to take on opposing viewpoints on the merits and defeat those ideas mm-hmm. on an equal playing field. They want to delegitimize, demonize, disqualify through bullying and silencing. And that's what we noticed really last year is getting really bad. And we decided we need to write a book. And this is the final product. End of discussion. You know, it's a it's the perfect time for you to launch this book because of what you were discussing last night with Megyn Kelly. Mm-hmm. And that is Jerry Seinfeld, not a known mm-hmm. Somebody conservative. Somebody just put that on the live chat. Coming out saying last night... Um, you know, to, again, about this PC culture where he says you can't make jokes anymore because you will hear it from everybody. And I, I thought his point was so good about people feeling just so personally offended. I mean, everyone thinks they have a voice that they can shout down someone like Jerry Seinfeld when he's just simply <coughs> making a joke. Right. Yeah. And, but and but isn't, that, isn't that the role of comedy? Isn't that what comedy is supposed to do? Isn't, isn't that what we ask of it? And he's yeah. saying that, you know, especially college campuses are so PC. They're just comedy killers. And he and a lot of other high profile comedy will not perform at college campuses anymore. So we have a whole chapter and a discussion on academia and the madness there. It's called Speech Police Academy. And then Ooh, we have a chapter... Like well, you'll like this one even better, I think. Our chapter on the war on comedy, we call it the Uptight Citizens Brigade. And we interviewed <laughs> Adam Carolla for the That's book. Right. And it, right. this really is the part, and we talked about it on the on-air show, too, it's not just making us less free and less able to debate ideas openly. It also is making the country actively a less fun place to live, where everyone's looking over their shoulder and walking on eggshells mm-hmm. all the time. How are we allowed to talk about these things? Mm-hmm. Comedians, for goodness sake. Jerry Seinfeld is not a controversial comedian. He's not that edgy. He's Jerry Seinfeld. Jay Leno has made similar points. Chris Rock has made yeah, this point. Yeah, Chris Rock is yep. particularly... Well, he... Yeah. But he's got a lot in his act that, you know, he drops the N-word. He does a he lot does, of things but a lot of people. But you should be able to do that as a comedian. And you should especially be able to do that on a college campus. Show up, test drive your stuff for young, hip people. So here's my question. Yeah. And, and I've had this discussion, actually, with one of our cohorts, Greta Van Susteren, before. Because, you know, we have certain words that when we look at constitutionally where free speech begin, it begins and ends that you cannot say if it's not true. Right? Slam so you can't. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater where there is actually no fire. Mm-hmm. It's not the word. It's the fact that it's not true and you send panic. Is it? Is the list growing? Is that what's happening? I mean, is there a place yes. in your book? I mean, because I feel like the list now is you can't yell anything that might hurt somebody's feelings because that's like yelling fire in a crowded theater where, where there are no flames. And Mary Catherine and I don't, we are not pro-rudeness, right, in end of discussion. We're not saying, let's go out and be provocative and just say things to offend people because we can. We think that you should treat people the way you want to be treated. The golden rule has a lot of wisdom mm-hmm. there in the Bible. But the problem is what we're seeing from the outrage industry, from the perpetually outraged grievance mongers, is that they are abusing Americans' sense of fairness and politeness in the golden rule and trying to ever uh, ongoingly that's not a word expand the lexicon and vocabulary of banished phrases terms and even thoughts where people are reticent to even maybe wade into debates for fear of crossing these people and being in some cases lose their jobs lose friends i mean look at look at climate change you can't have a discussion without politicizing anyone's response to it and, and that is that is so mm-hmm. anti-science if you can't question someone's premise you're not doing you actually are not engaged in the scientific method mm-hmm. and you know it, it's a different way of ending that discussion you want to end the discussion of someone that you disagree with yeah. and uh it's very very dangerous it's anti-american all right from the live chat 
Uh, Craft Cop says, I agree. Everybody needs to grow a thicker skin so we can continue to progress. Can you imagine the Continental Convention if everybody there avoided the issues that were not PC? Uh, Larry Jobber says, I hope that Outnumbered never gets to PC. Mm, yeah. I can guarantee that. <laughs> not, not with this cast. There is no way. Part of the problem, is it's, not, it's politicizing uh, an argument, but also personalizing an yes. argument. Yeah. Just, yes. It just kills me if you're in a debate with somebody and it becomes personal it just ruins it it's no longer it's no longer an even fair debate that being said i probably made one of the most awkward transitions from from <laughs> I, I i grew up trade i grew up on a trading floor in chicago literally as like 16 years old my dad had me in sneakers down on the trading floor and it was like all men and these like big burly like kind of size mattered in the trading pits for a long time no longer is the case obviously but Anything went in those trading pits. You could say anything, do anything. I mean, there was like gross hot dog eating kind of, and at that time there was like brilliant people down on the trading floors. Sounds I mean, you amazing. Really, it really was. I mean, it was an amazing is it still environment. Like to that? Be, no, no, it's gone. Um, it, I mean, in fact, the, the actual physical trading floors are closed. But I mean, that summer. attitude of openness. No, no it's just no. Oh, I was people down there the are hot like hot dog eating contest and the big men. Yeah, you, Sam. but anyway, I made this awkward transition from like that sort of. I was at the tail end of like seeing sort of the heyday of the trading. Floor. And then, like, going back to school, because I was there in the summers, and then I actually went there out of college and everything. And then I had to go into a corporate environment. I'm like, oh, my gosh. It was just so how stifling. PC. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was actually amazing to see in the trading pits how like, people just said whatever they wanted. And, yeah, you probably took it. You were kind of like, wow, am I? Like, am I fat? Like, you know, like, <laughs> guys were constantly, like, saying things to each other. And I'm sure they kind of asked themselves. But they got it out there, and there was never any, I don't know. It was just, like, it was fascinating frat, frat to see house it. mentality. But, look, I think bit. the point you made about the personalization of it is Brittle. such a crucial Brittle. one. Yeah. Because, yeah. for example, we can have a disagreement on, let's say, gay marriage. I'm for it. People that I know and love very much are against it. And the best way for me to shut down the discussion or to make sure that we have a terrible conversation is for me to say, oh, well, you disagree with me because you're a hateful bigot and you hate people. That's right. Yeah. Right. Right. Saying, well, let's actually right. discuss this. That's the biggest problem. And it's not just, I think, public figures that are experiencing this. Of course, politicians, people in the media, we sort of sign up for some of this criticism. But this is trickling down. Guy, in my opinion, people. that becomes the end of the discussion. Yeah, moral yeah, judgments, though. You're right. absolutely um, right. People make moral judgments when they feel like they can no longer win an argument on its own merit. Mm-hmm. A lot of people talk about this on the live chat. This is a hot button today. Stanis says free speech is always provocative. Um, and, oh, Rufus Sulphur writes this. PC equals, we say political correctness. He says public control. Mm. Mm. I mean, that that's an insight. That's yeah. definitely How, and and the internet gives people the power, so they're already feeling to entitled, do it. yeah, anonymously, right? I mean, I guess, right? And that's what Seinfeld had hit on. You know, why do people feel that they have the right to be able to shut someone else down? I mean, to me, that's just crazy. Like for me to silence you, Guy Benson. Like, why, Andrea Tinteros, do I have the right to silence you from saying? what you want to say, and to your point, in the meanest of ways. But I guess if I'm just hiding behind my little Twitter handle, right. I have all and the courage in the avatar, world. your fake avatar, right? Yeah, and I find that people, when you call them out on Twitter, which we're not really supposed to do, but sometimes when you do it, they they cower. And, I mean, if you see it, too, because, you know, my tw- Twitter followers in the past have started to pay attention to things when I will retweet a nasty thing someone says. Mm-hmm. Well, they don't like it then when you call them out. It's like they have all the courage in the world to their 12 followers. Yeah. But when I say, hey, why don't I open up your free speech to, I don't know, almost my 400,000 followers, oh, they don't like it. Then, 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 no, 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 right. no, 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 no. They don't want to hear from my you know, friends on Twitter, what they think. I think oh. it's such an important point about the Internet. I'm a huge fan of the Internet overall, plus minus. It's, it's a great positive for society. But it does, especially social media, does allow a new platform for these outrage mobs to gather and yeah. form and have these tornadoes of fury around mm-hmm. people, even average people who just mm-hmm. might have said something on Facebook or Twitter that they didn't totally think through. And, and I think that the best thing to keep in mind for people who find themselves under fire, is that it's often this tiny minority of loud people yelling at them when most people don't care or might even agree with them. Mm. All right, uh, one last one. Good point, Guy, from Handcuffed, (laughs) spelled C-U-F-T. Attack the messenger when you cannot argue the message. That's exactly Um, right. All right, let's end this discussion with... End of discussion. Hold your books up. End the discussion. Um, you want to hold mine up? Please Since, do. Yeah, is, you seem like you need a book. There we go. I don't know which camera I'm on, but end uh, of discussion, end of discussion.com. 
All right. Very Sounds good. good. And say you, hello ladies. to You're Mary welcome. Catherine Ham for us. We love her. I will. We we love her, too. And I'll see you tonight on Kennedy. On, on Kennedy. Kennedy. There you go. 8 a.m. Eastern. Eastern. New Any, time. Anybody else want to plug anything? New time. New time. <laughs> okay. Uh, me, 5 a.m. Fox Business Network tomorrow. Amen. FBM. FBN AM. Picture in picture with Kennedy tonight when I'm on the O'Reilly Factor. You can make me the star. <laughs> James, like, I'm out of here. I'm just going to the green room. Like, I got nothing going on. Tomorrow noon Eastern for Outnumbered TV version. Bye.